Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship here at St. Paul this morning as it's still Christmas. I don't know, do you still have your tree up at home? Yeah? People are thinking about moving on from Christmas now, but before we do, we still have the tree up here. Let's celebrate Epiphany this morning, which is the coming of the wise men and Jesus being revealed as the king of the world. Uh, We don't need to look anywhere else. Jesus is our king. So we come this morning, just like the wise men did, to worship him as they did too. So I'm praying God would be with you and me in our worship this morning. Let's begin with the opening hymn, which is printed for you on page three of your worship folder. Let's rise for worship. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen. Give the King your justice, O God, and your righteousness to the Royal Son. May He judge your people with righteousness, and your poor with justice. Let the mountains bear prosperity for the people and the hills in righteousness. May He defend the cause of the poor of the people, give deliverance to the children of the needy, and crush the oppressor. See, darkness covers the earth. Thick darkness is over the people. Therefore, let us call out to Christ Jesus, our source of light and forgiveness. Shine on our darkness, Lord Jesus. We confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. Forgive us, dear Lord, for sinning in our thoughts Forgive us, dear Lord. For sinning in our words, forgive us, dear Lord. For sinning in our actions, forgive us, dear Lord. Through your sacrificial death on the cross, forgive us, dear Lord. 
Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us. And for His sake, God forgives us all our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, and by His authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Taste and see. Let us pray. O oh God, by the leading of a star, you made known your only begotten Son to the Gentiles. Lead us, who know you by faith, to worship you with our best, now until we worship you before your divine presence perfectly in heaven. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please be seated as we hear God's Word. God had predicted already in the Old Testament that Jesus would be the Savior, not just of some people, but even the Gentiles too. Here's a reading from Isaiah chapter 60, where God proclaimed the Messiah as the one who'd bring light to the world. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples, but the Lord rises upon you, and His glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes and look about you. All assemble and come to you. Your sons come from afar, and your daughters are carried on the arm. Then you will look and be radiant, and your heart will throb and swell with joy. The wealth on the seas will be brought to you. To you the riches of the nations will come. Herds of camels will cover your land, young camels of Midian and Ephah, and all from Sheba will come, bearing gold and incense and proclaiming the praise of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Let's join in the psalm together, Psalm 72. Uh, let's sing this psalm together.
In the second reading today, we turn to the New Testament. The Apostle Paul, who just marvels at this amazing thing that God is not just a savior of the Jewish people, but of the whole world. And Paul was sent as an apostle that fact. Here's a reading from Ephesians chapter 3. Surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is, the mystery made known to me by revelation as I have already written briefly. In reading this then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to men in other generations, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of His power. Although I am less than the least of all God's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to His eternal purpose which He accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In Him, and through faith in Him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. This is the Word of the Lord. Respect for our Savior. Let's rise as we hear about Him in the Gospel today. Here in Matthew chapter 2, we hear about the coming of the wise men. This will serve as the basis of the message today. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh, and, having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they return to their country by another route. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Please be seated as we sing hymn number 83. I invite children to come forward during verse 2 for the children's devotion.
Good morning. And oh, we got more coming. Good morning and happy new year. We're still on the edge of Christmas, right? You just celebrated, but now many of you are back at school and back into the regular schedule. But we still want to talk a little bit about Christmas. And who were the first people that, that came to worship Jesus that first night when he was born? Who were the first people that showed up? Yeah. The shepherds, did. they came from the fields, and there were angels announcing it was pretty amazing. Glory to God in the highest. And it was a little later on. A lot of times it make it look like it happened at just the same night that the, the wise men came to. And, and the wise men came a little later. We're going to talk about them today. And this is from the manger set we have in our house, just two of the wise men. We don't know how many there were. There were three gifts. And the wise men came from a long way away. I mean, we're talking 1,000 miles maybe. And they came on foot. And do you notice if you look closely, what do the wise men bring? What, do you remember what some of the... The gifts that they brought? Yeah. Frankincense was one that's a really expensive spice. Anything else? Do you remember? Gold was another one, too. That's really... And do you remember what the other one was? Myrrh. That's another expensive spice, too. Really expensive gifts. How many of you have gold sitting underneath your pillow at home? Do you have a bunch of gold? Oh, careful. Do you have a bunch of gold? No. How many of you have a bunch of myrrh that's just sitting in a bowl on top of your dresser? No, you probably don't have that either. We don't have maybe those expensive gifts to give, do we? And even at your age, you can't even have a job and make a bunch of money, so you can't give these amazing gifts to the king who came, Jesus who came to save you, but you know you can give him your best. Do you know how you do that? Do you know how you worship Jesus and give your best? Let me give you some examples. You know, one way is, is what you're doing right here now. You're looking at me and you're paying attention because we're talking about Jesus, the most important person who has ever come. He's your God and Savior. By listening, you know you're giving him worship. By, by praying to him, by folding your hands and praying, that's another way that you can worship Jesus. Praying before meals, before bed, thanking him for all he's done. By, by listening to your parents too, by behaving well. These are all ways that you can bring gifts to Jesus and say, thank you, Jesus, for all you've done for me. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for me. Thank you, Jesus, for opening up the doors of heaven to me. You know, we can worship Jesus by everything we do. Let's, let's do this. Let's hold our hands and bow our heads and say this prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you for coming to be my Savior. Thank you for giving your best to me. Help me by everything I do, by my words, by my behavior, by all the things I do to give you the worship you deserve. In Jesus I pray. Amen. Now you can continue to worship Jesus by going back and finishing the hymn with your parents.
God's grace, his mercy, his peace are yours through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is the King, worthy of your worship. Amen. The word of God we looked to was read from the gospel lesson. I'd like to just read the, uh, the end of that as they get to the place where Jesus and Mary and Joseph were, and we see the, the reaction of the Magi. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. God speaks. How do you determine whether someone is wise in your eyes? I don't think there's just one way that we do that. There's maybe many different categories of, of wisdom. I went to school a lot of years, and I bumped into some very, very wise people People that, when you asked a question, I, I don't think ever in the semester I had them, they ever uttered the words, I don't know. They always seem to have an answer, and, and that wisdom tends to run off on you. When you hear wisdom, you write it down, you take notes. I still have some of those notes from college and seminary, too, and sometimes go back and reflect on that, going, oh, yeah, that's right. There's other people that maybe don't have the degrees, but... They are, just have this practical knowledge. You, you go to them when you have an issue with something in just general life or when you have a car or, or something like that, and you go, and they just seem to know what to do. And you're like, how did you know that? Well, I just, I just it's the way I think. And they'll fix this and do that, and you look and say, wow, you're, you're taking notes. They're wise in what they're doing. Sometimes it can be in the, in the category of, of just their, their, their kindness, their nature, just the way that they carry themselves. You think that person is, is wise in, 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 in the way that they, they treat other people. They're, they're wise in the way that they care. And, and you just want to take notes on how, how they posture themselves. Like, wow, if I could only be that kind, if I could only be that nice and, and that good. And you just soak it in when you rub elbows with these people. Well... Today we're in the presence of wise men, and, and we're not really told specifically what they were wise in. Maybe they were wise in the, in the area of science, because it seems that they were looking at stars, and they must have been some kind of historians that they would go back to, to sacred books. We're, we're not quite sure what gave them their smarts, what their occupation might have been, though they did bring some pretty bold treasures but we're told that they're wise. And, and maybe it wasn't the book smarts or things that they got in, in life that, that people look at them and say wise. I, I believe as we look at Scripture, why I would say they were wise is they followed the star. And that's just a modern-day miracle if you think about it, that a star, you think of how high they are and, and that this star, of all the millions of stars out there, would have attracted their attention. They would have connected it to words of Scripture. I have no idea how the word, the prophecies that were in the Bible among the Jews would have got way over to the east. It, by God's guiding, that message went a long way outside of Israel, and they connected the dots to go on a trek that would take them a long way in search of what Scripture said, a, a king. They went in search of a king. Now, we're not sure exactly where they were from or even how many there were. There were three gifts. Were there three wise men? They, they were wise men, a group of them. And we don't know whether they were from modern-day Iran or Babylon or, or where, where they had come from. But maybe to give you an idea what you're bumping against here as far as the distance they travel, if you put on your track shoes and decided to start walking south, you'd probably maybe get to the north end of Florida before you'd stop, that, that's quite a trek, you think? And to do that on foot or on camel, and, and it wasn't down highways or bike paths. It was across desert and, and interesting terrain. And yet they went in search of the king, and they actually did find a king. 
Of course, where would you go when you went to that area of the world? You'd go to Jerusalem. That's where you'd find a king, right? And they did find a king. And he claimed himself to be the king of the Jews. But he wasn't the king that they were looking for. He wasn't the true king. And when we take a look at the, the character of the king, we'll understand why all Jerusalem was disturbed when these guests came and started asking questions about, who's the one that would be born king? Herod was maybe about 69-ish years old, so he's kind of growing up in life and coming to the end of his years. And he was zealous about his throne. And in his time, as king to protect his throne, he had already killed his mother-in-law, his wife, the two sons from that wife, and just to make sure that no one had a claim, he took out his wife's brother too. Now you understand when someone had a claim to the throne or there was some other king, why Herod might have caused a stir throughout Jerusalem as people started to chew their nails a little bit. And it's interesting that Herod reacted the way he did too because when they said, where is this king of the Jews? Herod didn't say, well, right here, you're looking at him. Herod knew. Who did he call together? Immediately he went and called together those that were of the church, those Jews that would know these things, the scribes. And he says, what is this prophecy that's being spoken of? And where was this king to be born? And they immediately came back and read the prophecy. It was in Judah, Bethlehem to be specific, that this one who would be the king, the king, would come. And this was the anointed one. Not like earthly kings with earthly power, with temporary protections. This was the king anointed. And, and anointing in those days was pouring on of oil. And they did this with, with the priests. They did this with the prophets. And, and they did this with the kings because they were set apart by God for a very specific and godly purpose. We have our inaugurations today where you put your hand in the Bible and you swear in front of the nation and you have all the dignitaries there and you do it in front of the, the other houses and, and the other, uh, all those that are in, in the government. But this was special. This king was unique because he came to conquer eternal enemies. And his rule was going to be complete and total. But Herod must have bumped up against this before because he had a knowledge of this king that the Jews spoke of, and he just ignored it. And Herod only saw that this maybe was a possible rivalry to his throne, so he had this plan, although he made it sound like he was being, um, uh, he was going to go and, and worship along with the wise men. He made it sound like he wanted to go and do the proper thing. If this is a king who was born, foretold from long ago, come back and tell me about it so that I can go and worship too. Wink, wink. Herod had no intention of worshiping the king. And in fact, not to give away where scripture goes in this, but we see what, what Herod did when he found the wise men went a different way. Bethlehem was mourning and, and moms were mourning as he went and slaughtered babies to see that this king would be rooted out. The wise men, being told to come back, knew immediately that this king did not have good intentions. And they were delighted when they finally got that star that led them out of Jerusalem to the real town, to Bethlehem. So this morning, let's take a walk with wise men. Wise men who came simply to worship. They didn't obey Herod, not earthly kings or pressures, not at all. Uh, in fact, they came to worship what at that time what they would have seen was not anything with a crown on their head, but a baby, a newborn, a, maybe a... How many days old? We're not quite sure. And yet, they worshipped. And as we walk along with wise men, I'll ask you the, the, the question too. Would you have followed the same path as the wise men? That's an interesting question, isn't it? I mean, you're here this morning to, to worship this, this king that you've never held in your arms. Maybe in your mind you think, well, of course, I would have totally done the same thing. If Herod would have pressured me, I would have thought nothing of ignoring him, even though the whole way home I'm looking behind me to see whether I was hotly being pursued by a Roman garrison out for my blood. They thought nothing of it, and they bowed to worship a baby. They thought nothing of it because of the miracle that God had revealed in them. 
that this was the king, this was God's plan, this was the solution, this was God's best given to the world, and his reign wouldn't be temporary, and their eternities were to be impacted by it, so they went another way back home. Let's walk along with wise men and ask some important questions, because I think that we deal with, with similar questions and similar pressures. When we are pressured to do things against the king or to forfeit worship with the king, where do we land in that? How do we act when pressures that be around us, those that claim earthly authority, put pressure on? Do we bow a knee and, and worship? Just some examples. When we're pressured by people around us that we hang out with, let's say the 21st birthday or maybe New Year's Eve, it's the one time we can get together, no one's driving, that we can get completely tanked. Is that following the way of the king? Or is that bowing to other pressures? When we have a world that just says whatever to whatever, when it comes to morality, when it comes to uh, the way that we carry ourselves, our character, when it comes to doing things that are inappropriate and improper, do we, do we kneel and bow to that freedom? Or do we worship the king and carry ourselves like that? When it seems the most important thing is what you acquire and what you have and what you make of yourself, the way that you look and how cool you are and how you achieve, that's the most important thing and those things aren't wrong in and of themselves. But do they become the king that we worship? We sacrifice so much to raise the perfect kids, giving them every possible experience, to have the perfect lives and to do the perfect things. We amass wealth like you wouldn't believe so that we can do the things of this world and say, look what I've done. But do we lose an opportunity to kneel and offer our best to him because we give him the pressure of thinking me first? Those are interesting things to ponder when it comes to worshiping the king. And as we walk along with wise men, I think we have to see that they kneeled to other kings well, you might say, wait a second, they, they walked a long way and they did the right thing. They're the example, but think about this. Why did they walk so far? What were they looking for? They were looking for the true king that would bring actual peace, real peace, peace of heart and mind that would give them answers to what happens to me when I die, that would solve the problem of guilt that would solve the spiritual issue that divide between us and God, yes, they must have bowed a knee to other pressures. They were sinners, and they looked for the real king. And when they found him, what did they do? They worshipped. And I think sometimes when you look at those nativity sets, they get the chronology wrong. You look at those, and you have the shepherds there at the same time, and the angels right there, and you have the wise men right there, and they're all at the same time. And they have the wise men, usually even the ones I brought today, are not really... I would say scriptural, even though they brought gifts, but they were standing there offering, and we don't really know, but, but the posture that scripture gives here is they bowed down and worshipped. Now, I know how captivating a newborn baby is. Oh, my goodness, when you have that newborn baby you see in the hospital for the first time, and this is a baby that's related to you, oh, it captures the heart. You want to just smell the breath and kiss the cheeks, and oh, you just light up. It just lights up the whole room. But have you ever gone into the hospital and there in the basket seen the baby, got down on your hands and knees and put your face to the floor and worshipped that child? But they understood this was no ordinary child. This was the king. And they were standing in the presence of God in the flesh. And when you stand in the presence of God and you worship, your posture is, what have I done? But it's also a posture of, wow. What has God done for me? And that's really what's happening here because we see the reaction that follows. They're in the presence of the king. They're down to worship. And what's the next reaction as we walk along with wise men? Let's look at the gifts that they brought. Let's, let's back the camera up and look at the whole package here. I think it's important as we're given a great example of worship. People way, way off in the east walking a thousand miles to come and worship. I think the first sacrifice they gave was their time. I mean, think about that. That is quite a journey. 
and for one purpose to go because they didn't go and say, all right, Jesus, I got about an hour to give you this morning. We're going to sing that final hymn and I'm out of here because I got a busy life to lead. So you get an hour a week. No. Think of the sacrifice of time that, that they gave. And the next thing that they gave was they offered them some tokens. It was treasures that they had brought a long way and out of the threat of having it stolen by the people that roamed those trails and the robbers, they brought their best. They offered to him what they had and maybe in their minds they thought, this is nothing compared to what this child is going to do and bring. To live in my place, to die the death I deserve and only for the purpose of sharing that kingdom that's all his with me? This is just a token, but, but it is my best and and I offer it. And then to think nothing of defying Herod, who had told them to go and, and reveal who this child was, and they knew that this was a plot and a ploy, ploy to take him out, so they went their other way. Their lives were to Jesus. They thought nothing of giving of their lives. Worship. But isn't that what wise men and women do? That's really what happens when wisdom rubs off on wise men and women. They don't want to stay off in the east. They want to get close. They want to worship. They want this to be the focus of, of what they do. This is the most important thing. And they worship. They give of their time to do this. They don't want to stay off in the east pursuing things of, of their own uh, personal pursuits. They don't want to go and spend the money all on themselves. They don't want to live these lives that are closed off, maybe inviting God in on occasion. No, no, no. They want to come and worship him and, and give him the best. And when all the pressures come in in life, all the things, all the decisions we can make, they think nothing of sacrificing for the king what he says. Because it's the king. We walk along with wise men because we are wise men and women too. And, and today you're giving of your time. You're, you're chiseling out this time on a Sunday morning. I'm sure there's plenty on your list. But it's time to worship the king. And I ask, is, is it possible that maybe more time can be given? Maybe more time as you look at how you prioritize? More time can be focusing on the king, worthy of, of that worship of time. And, and today you, you, offer, you offer treasures that soon have the plate passed. You offer your treasures to the king. But I ask you, maybe in, in wisdom, is it, is it time to look and say, is this just a token? Is this about what I would give as a tip? Or, or perhaps as I look at it, is this treasure that I present to the king worthy of, of such worship? And when it comes to the other things that other kings and, and other people in power put upon me, do I think nothing of, of saying no? Do I think nothing of following the precious narrow path that, that I've been put on? Because that's worship worthy of the king. That, that's what wise men and women do. Can we really do that? It seems like an awful lot, and, and that's, that seems like pressure is being put on. But it's good pressure. In fact, it's not pressure at all. It's allowing your, your, your heart to speak and move because it's been touched by the king who still reigns. You see, as we, we look at our lives and the, and the gifts that we bring, the worship that we offer, it, it's not about what we have. It's not about even who we are or make ourselves. It's not about friends and, and possession and things. It's about the real king who reigns, and it, it happens to be Jesus. And we have opportunity as God gives us life and time and treasures and talents to offer gifts worthy of the king. And so let's walk along with my men. Remember how we started that when you bump into people that are wise, they, they tend to rub off on you? You take that wisdom, you take notes, you think about it, you go, and, and it changes your actions, it changes your thoughts, you're blessed by it. Well, today God has allowed us to walk along with wise men. But that isn't the motivation of why you do what you do. It's because of the king. The one that they came to worship, the one that you worship. And may God bless it as you bring to him in all your actions, sacrifices, worship, worthy of the king. Amen. Please stand. Now may the peace of God, which passes our understanding, lead our hearts and our minds to worship as the wise men, the king.
the king of our hearts, the king who rules all things, the king whose kingdom he will share with us. Amen. I invite you to open your service folders to page 10 as we join our hearts and voices in confessing our faith in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. As our treasures are gathered this morning for the king, we also ask you to take this time to sign the friendship register. You'll find it on both ends of the aisle, leaving a record of your worship with us here. And if there's any way that we can serve you further, and especially to our guests, if there's any way that we can serve you further, please leave us information that we may do so. Let's rise for prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God and Mary's Son, in the fullness of time you came into our world to save us from sin and death. Beloved Son of the Father, Revered by the Magi, baptized by John, you came preaching and teaching, healing and comforting, forgiving and encouraging. Prince of Peace, shine like a beacon for us and the people of our world. Let the good news of salvation be heard in the remotest corners of the earth. 
Open our own lips to speak of your name to those around us who still live without faith or hope. Lord of the Church, let your peace rule our hearts that we may use our gifts to serve you and each other in willing gratitude and joy. Watch over our loved ones near and far that they may remember your love and rejoice in your salvation. Strengthen the faith of the sick and the disheartened. Give hope to those in despair and comfort those who mourn. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Finally, bring us and all your believers to the heavenly home where we will stand in the full light of your glory. And with all your saints and angels, sing the everlasting song of triumph. Amen. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. As we sing the next hymn note, we'll sing verses 1 through 3 of hymn 79.
Let's rise for prayer. O Lord God, our Heavenly Father, pour out the Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us strong in your grace and in your truth. Protect and comfort us in all temptation. And bestow on us your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. that hymn, the final two verses of hymn 79. 